Welcome to this week's edition of Good Books Radio. I'm your host, Dr. W.F. Strong, and we have a wonderful book for you today called uh, Team Dog, How to Train Your Dog the Navy SEAL way. Before we get to that, I want to remind you that we are underwritten. Good Books Radio is underwritten by audiobooks.com. So if you'd like to hear this interview again, you can hear it on a podcast via our Facebook page, Good Books Radio, or on our YouTube channel, Good Books Radio. This particular book today is exciting to me because I've lived uh, a life with dogs, as many of you have. And we're going to get some truly expert advice from Mike Ritland, who is a a Navy SEAL. And he has uh, been training dogs for a a very long time. Um, The Navy SEALs, of course, are known as the teams. And this is for good reason. Every member of the unit understands the role he has to play, spends hours of working together to build trust, and through repetition and commitment forges an unbreakable bond. So what Mike Ritland has done is taken that particular uh, team building ethic and developed a dog training uh, methodology around that. And he's going to share that uh, with us. So uh, what part he can, most of it, you're going to have to go to the book to get all of it. Uh, Mike is on the phone with us now. Mike, how are you today? I'm fantastic. Thank you for having me in the the warm intro. Oh, well, I tell you, I loved... Uh, your book on uh, a grand scale because uh, for one thing I had uh, although I was disappointed that you had problems with German shepherds in your youth (laughs) Uh, but I I had uh, I've had a a lot of German shepherds actually it's been my dog of choice and I had one in particular uh, about 10 years ago she died and I grieved her death more than most people uh, you know uh, grieve the loved ones they've lost that are human, but uh, uh, that's how attached we get, as you well know. But in any case, uh, in reading your book, I realized that I trained her well, uh, but maybe by accident. You know, maybe I just kind of stumbled on to good things. One, one aspect was that she was absolutely brilliant. She was an unusually smart dog all on her own. So uh, good intelligence genes. And uh, then the other thing I think is I just spent a great deal of time with her. Uh, You know, since she was a puppy, she lived with me. She went with me in the truck everywhere. If I went to the beach, she went to the beach. If I went hunting, she went hunting. And uh, so she was truly uh, a member of the family. And you talk about these things in your book. But before we get to that, I want to begin with something uh, just a, a, a question, because this comes up for people from time to time, and it's a, a moment of panic, and I want to get your advice about this as one who works with dogs and understands them intimately. If, um, if you're out walking down the street in a residential neighborhood and suddenly a big German shepherd uh, jumps the fence and runs at you, snarling and snapping, what do you do? Well, so from my perspective, it... it I guess the answer is it depends. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, there, there's one of two options you're going to take, and that depend that depends uh, depends on the type of person that you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so by that, I mean that that if you're the type of person where if push comes to shove, that you will stand up for yourself and and you know essentially uh, battle the dog if need be, then uh, then you stand stand your ground with that that attitude uh, absolutely brimming. Mm-hmm. Uh, from you, uh, mm-hmm. and, and think of it from a predatorial standpoint, in that everything that you're going to do with your body, uh, and not just with your body, but your mentality has to be there of, of thinking, I'm a predator and you're my prey, and I'm going to stand here, and, and I'm going to not just stand here, but I'm actually going to come forward towards you, and I'm going to pull your card, I'm going to call your bluff, and I'm going to say, uh, you know, without actually saying it, I, I'm going to I'm going to uh, non-verbally communicate to you. I'm here, I'm ready, I'm not scared of you. If you want to bring it, then bring it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and I, I will tell you from experience that 99.999% of all dogs that think uh, that they want to pick a fight with somebody, if, if you do that back to them and you actually mean it, they, they want absolutely nothing to do with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, granted, there are exceptions in that there are dogs that will say, yeah, you know what, I'm not scared of you either, I'm coming after you. And, mm-hmm. and if that, that does happen, then you, you have to do what you have to do. Uh, from from my perspective, and, and as somebody who's been bit a number of times, more than I can even care to, to remember, 
Um, you know, if the dog has a collar on him and he bites you, grab the back of his collar, twist it, and lift up and, and take his air away. Mm. Uh, no different than an MMA fighter, you know, doing a rear naked choke, choke the dog off of you uh, until he go, either goes unconscious or, or submits. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, preferably just choke him unconscious, let go of him, and, and move about your way and, and, and be done with it. Uh, you know, a lot of times people, they want to smack the dog, fight the dog, whatever, and, and it's just the wrong answer. I mean, when mm -hmm. you have, uh, you know, uh, teeth buried to the gum line inside mm -hmm. you, the last thing you want to do is, is, is move. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you just want to take their air away as quick as, as possible. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that's, that's on the one hand. If you're the other type of person, uh, then it's really at the, at, the, at the will of the dog. Mm -hmm. uh, you, that's something that when you're faced with that, if you don't have it in you, you can't fake it. Uh, it's either there or it's not. And mm -hmm. so... Uh, you know, in that case, your best thing is to try to get something between you and the dog, even mm -hmm. if it's a, a garbage can, a, mm -hmm. a chair, a fence, a doorway, I mean, uh -huh. anything that you can get. I don't care what it is. A, a, anything to, to to do, you know, to fend the dog off of you is, is going to be your best bet. Uh, if you do find yourself in a situation where you've done everything you can and now the dog is, is on you and you mm -hmm. can't do it, then you still want to apply that same concept mm -hmm. that I talked about and that at that point you have no other choice. Mm. Um, you know, so that, that's the harsh reality of of, uh, of a situation like that. But uh, that's uh, that's my my two prong take on how I would uh, deal with that. But what I would suppose that uh, running is the worst thing. Well, for sure it is. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I mean, there's it's impossible to say always and never. Yes, uh, yes true. You know, but but. Um, you know, generally speaking, yes. I mean, the only reason I would say, you know, for some people maybe running is better is if, you know, the dog is 70 feet away and there's uh -huh. a doorway 10 feet yes, away, then, yes. yeah, maybe run yes. run through the doorway and close it behind you and be done with it. But, uh, you know, in, in an instance where, you know, somebody who isn't that person that's ready to, to conflict the dog, uh, you know, yeah, if, if you can get away quick, great. But, uh, you know, my, my assumption is that you're in the middle of the street or you're right. on a sidewalk where that's not the case, and, and you're you're forced with a fight or flight, and uh, uh, and that's that's kind of what you have to do. But well, let's go to dog training. Having dogs that are supposedly friendly. <laughs> uh, yeah. What what are the uh, since you you've trained dogs for uh, all branches of the U.S. military, right? I, I have. I mean, I've, I've you know, I would say even, uh, well, I guess let me, let me take that a step back. Uh, for special operations forces, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, or I, I've had involvement in, uh, in multiple units. Uh, to say I've covered every branch, no. Okay. Uh, or even every, every facet of special operations, no. Um, you know, a multitude of facets within the Department of Defense, a multitude of facets within the, the U.S. government, yeah. uh, other government agencies, Customs, Border Patrol, et, et cetera. There's, there's a host of, of groups that I have, but uh, for sure not, not every single one of them. But in, nonetheless, you have uh, the right to wear the term expert proudly. I mean, you're one of the best. Uh, and, well, and, they, and people come to you to say, train these dogs for us, right? Correct. Okay. So... But you train dogs uh, for aggressiveness in some cases. Uh, absolutely, you know, and it's uh, it's probably one of the the single most uh, confused uh, aspects of dog training is uh, is not only allowing aggression, but actually trying to to embolden it, to bolster mm -hmm. it, to strengthen it, to to channel it, and and ultimately control it, which is a very tricky thing to do um, because it, you know aggression is a it's a combination of, of emotion and state of mind and mm -hmm. genetics and, and environment and stimulus, and it's all of these things kind of, you know, swirling around in a, in a violent, forwardly offensive action, uh, you know, that, that is tricky to, to manifest and, and control. And so um, there is a very, very uh, fine line that you're kind of tap dancing on, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to make sure that you're getting the most out of the dog while staying safe and, and keeping it controlled. Right. But uh, but yeah, you know, it's a component that uh, you know because of my experience with that, uh, it's made um, you know interacting with other dogs that most people you know may deem or see or think are aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, from my perspective, to to really understand it, is it really true natural forward aggression or is it peacock feathers uh, and a dog <laughs> that uh, you know has essentially learned through repetition yeah. that if he 
does a couple little things, people will leave him alone or be intimidated by him, and, and there's a huge difference. You know, and, and so um, most dogs are not inherently aggressive, even if, you know, they, they guard resources or they growl at you if you come near them or, or whatever. People think that it's this mean, nasty dog. Many times those behaviors are created uh, by us as humans because when they're puppies they growl a little bit. When you mess with them they think it's cute and they reinforce it without re- realizing, realizing that they're it, doing yes. so. Uh, you know, and, and you create problems. Mo- most, I would say 99% of all behavioral issues in dogs are created by human beings. Uh, you know, very, very few of them are purely genetic. Let's talk about some of those that, because, uh, you know, in your particular um, dog training method for us uh, uh, everyday people, not in war zones, not interested in, in pursuing extreme aggressiveness in dogs, we just want well-behaved dogs, uh, dogs at mind. Uh, what are the things that uh, people do that are that they do unintentionally that reinforces bad behavior? It makes dogs hard to live with. Sure, the, and I'm glad you asked that. I mean, because the, there, there's one single point of failure that that unquestionably, um, you know, drives or relates uh, to this specific problem. And, and I, I like to answer the question with a question. Mm-hmm. In that, and, and I ask a lot of people this the same question, and, and that kind of flips the light switch on. And that, if I was to say to you, whatever company you work for, the, the top ten executives want you to come give a presentation on what you do for the company. Mm-hmm. And if it goes well, you're going to get a huge promotion. If it goes poorly, you're going to be fired. <laughs> okay, so now, now if you walk into that boardroom and you interact with those people the same way that you interact with your dog, how would that presentation go? <laughs> and, and, and most people say I would get laughed out of that boardroom, uh, you know. And so, so now they they get it. You know where I'm going with this, and that you know if if that's how you're interacting with your dog, chances are uh, it's not going that well in terms of their level of respect for you, the mm-hmm. level of obedience that, that they have, etc. Uh, you know, the the the, the textbook or, or foundational thing we always always have to remember is that you can't explain anything to a dog. Um, if you always keep that in the back of your mind or in the front of your mind, rather, uh, then you'll realize you have to show them. Mm-hmm. And, and how do you show them? Well, it starts with uh, interacting with them the way that you would interact with those people in the boardroom. And that, you know, I can say, hey, I'm your new owner. You need to do it, what I tell you to do. That doesn't mean anything to a dog. Mm-hmm. You have to give them a reason to do that. And, and it starts by laying that foundation of exuding leadership-type qualities in, in how you carry yourself. Um, you know the the way that I do it the, the same way and, and the reason that I've 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 gotten so into this is because of the dog that I deal with. You have to be that way. If you're not that way to to a, a, a tenth caliber, they will walk all over you. Mm-hmm. Now all dogs will. It's just with these dogs, it's it's magnified to the point where you ha- like your your safety depends on your ability to be able to do that at the highest level mm-hmm. possible. Mm-hmm. And so. It makes it very easy to do it with dogs who aren't that way, just your normal average everyday house pets, to where sometimes it's too much for them, to where they're like, you know, they're a little bit taken aback and on their heels and intimidated because mm-hmm. you're playing it so hard. Right. Um, you know, but but that has to be there uh, in terms of you just carrying yourself, uh, in terms of being the subject matter of exuding stoic leadership, of, of emotional stability. You know, we've all had bosses that, that we were driven to work hard for, that were great leaders that carried themselves the way that I'm talking about right now. Yes. And then on the transverse, we've had people that, that didn't, you know, that were childish, that were petty, that, uh, you know, were inconsistent, that were not dependable, that were, uh, you know, two-faced, uh, you know, contradictory, uh, emotionally unstable, all, all of these things that, um, you know, that, that hamper uh, respect and, and good relationships. Uh, and so you, you always have to remember that is that, you know, if your dog is going to see you how you show him, mm-hmm. you know, so so you always have to do that. Now, once once that's established, then, yes, you can let your guard down a little bit. And, you know, a lot of times when I explain that to people, they think, oh, OK, well, you're just like a robot with your dog. And you, you don't enjoy the relationship and mm-hmm. your dog, you know, hates you and, and views you like a, a, a drill instructor. But no, um, you know. Love and affection and, and companionship and sociability, uh, you know, all of that stuff is a key component to having a good canine human relationship. But that can't be the, the staple right out of the gate. Right. 
uh, you know, it, it can't be the staple of the relationship, and it also can't be before those boundaries and, and who you are in the relationship have been established. Once they are, just like a good parent with their child, you're, you're not supposed to be their best friend and spoil them rotten. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't, you know, love on them and hug them and, and, and let them know that you're there to protect them and tickle them and play tag and have mm-hmm. fun. But when enough is enough, and, and ultimately you're the one running the show, you're the adult in the room, and you have to you have to manage you know the day to day operations. And so, you know, there's a lot of parallels there between raising you know toddlers into into young adults and, and raising yeah. you know dogs into productive canine citizens. Do you when you uh, pet a dog for reward or praise, uh, how do you pet them? You know, it, it depends a little bit on the dog, uh, but having said that, uh, generally I like to, to essentially reflect the behavior that I want out of them or, or the, you know, the attitude that they're carrying. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, it's not excitable. Uh-huh. You know, I, I think of, of petting and showing affection as, as a calming, uh, you know, gentle, more, more intimate type of interaction as mm-hmm. opposed to, you know, rustling around and, ah, yeah, you know, like playing rough and that kind of stuff. <laughs> Who's a good boy? Uh, now, yeah, I mean, if, if you want to, you know, want to play rough and have fun, that's great, uh, and, and you can, and I do that. But generally, uh, you know, again, most of the of the interaction in terms of petting and affection that I, that I show to dogs, uh, it, it's of a more, you know, mild-mannered, uh, more intimate nature. Mm-hmm. It, do you have a, a kind of um, best dog or uh, best breed for uh, military training, not. I mean, I, I realize you know, obviously, pets come in all all varieties for us ordinary people. But in terms of military, do you have like five breeds that are best? Sure. I mean, I would say there, there's three that overwhelmingly fill the role, uh, mm-hmm. and that's German Shepherds, Dutch Shepherds, and Belgian Malinois, which are all you know, it's, it's basically the same dog or, or very mm-hmm. very similar. Uh, now, there's subsets of those. I mean, there's the in the Belgian family, there's Taverans and uh, you know, a few other breeds that, uh, you know, that, that can fit the bill, too. Uh, Bouviers and, and some other European breeds that, that you see on occasion. But overwhelmingly, Dutch Shepherd, German Shepherd, Malinois are, are the three top, uh, you know, breeds that, that we, I wouldn't say that we necessarily use. I think a better way to look at it is uh, those three breeds overwhelmingly, uh, in terms of percentage, uh, pass the selection criteria. So it's not that there's necessarily a preference for the breed. It's it's no different than putting out a, a statement of work or a job description looking for an employee, <laughs> and that hey, here's and these, these guys five show things. up. <laughs> yeah, I mean, here's these five categories yeah. that that I need. You know, that I'm mm-hmm. scoring on a zero to ten scale, and those three breeds overwhelmingly, you know, pass that selection criteria. And, so, and what are those categories? So the the first category is is kind of a combination of of confidence uh, and sociability, which you know essentially kind of wrap into into each other. I want a dog that's not so aloof to where uh, it's going to take some time to get him to interact with me, but I don't want him to be my best friend right out of the gate either. I want just kind of that happy medium of, you know, yeah, he'll come over and check me out and, and you know, maybe let me pat him on the ribs or, or scratch his head for a second, and then he'll take a couple steps and go check something else out. You know, I don't want him to be flighty, but I don't want him to be overly affectionate either. Okay. Um, Number two? And, and that... that uh, number two is environmental stability. I want that dog to be able to go anywhere, everywhere, like he owns the place. Mm-hmm. Uh, no matter what it is, jumping up on sli- on slippery, uh, t- you know, it's a slick table or slippery floors, dark rooms, open stairwells, loud noises, walking through traffic, tail mm-hmm. up, wow. ears up, head up, you know, just walking around super, super confident. Number three is, is prey drive, uh, which is, you know, very simply anything that I wave in front of the dog's face, I want him to... to be excited over it, and if I throw it, he'll run and chase it, whether it's a tennis ball, a Kong ball, a chunk of wood, a piece of rebar, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, mm-hmm. uh, it needs to be of a very high level. Hunt drive kind of dovetails onto, which is number four. Basically, it's prey drive, but now I'm going to hold the dog back, and I'm going to throw those same objects into deep grass or, or hide them in a room and let him go, and, and I want to watch him use his nose mm-hmm. to search for it. Um, and then the last thing, uh, and this only pertains to on the working dog side for the aggression, if it's just a detection dog for narcotics, explosives, whatever, it's just the first four categories. The fifth category is for the apprehension or patrol dog, where essentially I want a dog that has true natural forward aggression. Mm. Essentially a dog that when, when I push him and I get in bed and I communicate to him kind of like I, when we led the segment with, 
when I do that to the dog, he says, yeah, I got your number, bring it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, again, there are so few dogs that, that really have that. If, if you really bring that to bear and say, I'm not scared of you, I'm coming after you, there are very, very few dogs that will sit there and, and bang it out with you. Yeah. Uh, the ones that do are, are the keepers. And, and, you know, I travel the world uh, to try to find these dogs. And there's times where I may be in an area and, and look at dozens or even hundreds of dogs that have been bred, raised, and trained for this type of work from, from birth mm-hmm. that don't, don't have, have that to them. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's a very, very uh, escaping quality genetically in a dog. Well, as you went through that list, I was thinking of my brilliant German Shepherd I had years ago, and uh, she fit all of those except maybe, uh, you know, lack of aggressiveness, but that was just because of the way that she probably had the potential, but because of the way that I raised her, she wasn't that way, but she was a dog that needed a purpose. You know, I, I, I lived on a farm, and I would have guys run out and hide in the woods, and I'd let her watch them run, and then I would say, go get them. And I'd let her yeah. go, and she'd go find them. You know, she she just yeah, no, it's awesome. she just loved to have a purpose. But uh, like you say, I'm sure there are uh, subtle idiosyncrasies that might have made her unworthy of what you're talking about. But she had, in general, these things which made her uh, an exceptional dog. Uh, you know, for me, uh, because yeah. she seemed to understand language and all. But one of the things you say in the book that. I really liked, as you pointed out, that about 98% of the communication with dogs uh, is nonverbal, and and mm-hmm. and it's helpful to focus on that if you want to train them well. No, absolutely. You know, the the thing that uh, that trips a lot of people up, and and it kind of you know coincides with you know what I was talking about earlier and how you carry yourself. But uh, but to to kind of expand on that is that you know you you can look at somebody walking down the street and and get a really good idea of what kind of day they're having mm-hmm. uh you know if, if you pay any kind of attention to them or how somebody a complete stranger walks into a restaurant if you really spend 30 seconds really observing what they're doing how they're doing it how they're carrying themselves you get a pretty good idea of, of what's going on with sure. them what kind of person they are Absolutely. all that kind of thing and so if, if you think about that from the context of of human beings are overwhelmingly verbal and how we communicate, and, and even with that, it's still very, very easy for us to distinguish those nuances, those idiosyncrasies with with human beings uh, on a nonverbal platform. So now, take it up ten notches to a dog, where that's the only way they communicate. Mm-hmm. You know that there's no other. I mean, the verbal aspect of a dog's communication is it there? Yes, but it, it, it's a, a fraction of a percentage in terms of, of mm-hmm. how they really communicate. If you watch two dogs meet each other, there are so many little little nuanced things that are taking place between the, the two dogs that most people have no idea are taking place. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you think about that, it, it should highlight how just excruciatingly important it is for you to be self-conscious and self-aware of what you're doing with your body or not doing in certain circumstances uh, to communicate certain things to that dog. And it's not it's not overly complicated. A lot of people, I think, you know, think it's daunting that you've got to become some body language expert. It's really not. I mean, you already know all of the things. Just like I said, you can look at somebody and know how they're doing. You know, do dogs manifest some of their emotions and body language a little differently? Yes. But all you have to do is pay attention to them. You know, watch the dog and see how they react. And, and that's the problem with, with uh, most people is they don't really pay attention to their dog. Uh, you know, their 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 face is buried in uh, in their phone, checking yeah. Facebook, well, or, that true? or watching TV, or or whatever, and and uh, and they're not really observing their dog. You know, turn the TV off, put your phone down, and watch your dog. Play with them. Watch how they play. Watch how they walk. Watch how they go to the bathroom. Watch how they investigate new things. Watch how they get comfortable to go to sleep. Uh, you know, watch how they move. Uh, all of those little things are going to tell you about your dog. You know, and and if you don't know those, you're you're never you're always going to be the dark. You're never going to really understand what's going on with them. We have a couple of minutes left. I wanted to uh, move over to talk a little bit, uh, change subject, so to speak. I want to talk about the Warrior Dog Foundation, which you established. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how we might get involved in that. Sure. So uh, you can visit just warriordogfoundation.org. Uh, and basically our primary mission for years now has been to act as a retirement first uh, and rehabilitation, rehoming vehicle second uh, for uh, former special operations working dogs. And so, uh, you know, we've done it with dozens of dogs at this point. We've rehomed most of them. Um, and, and 
we have uh, you know a singular goal of, of just being a resource for these units that that can't care for for these dogs in the capacity that they need once they're you know at the age or, or physical capacity to where they need to be retired. Do you uh, have to have you know, people who are uh, kind of ex-military to handle these dogs? Are they difficult? Uh, for sure, they are difficult. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the dogs that we get are the ones that uh, you know we don't get them because they're easy to deal with. Mm-hmm. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, it, it does take a, a very high level of experience. Not necessarily from a military standpoint. I've had a number of uh, you know of civilians that have worked for me. I mean, the big thing is is just understanding uh, canine behavior, being mm-hmm. able to read read a dog and understand uh, you know what they do. I will say that every civilian that I've had that that has you know, been integrated into this process, has had some experience with bite dogs, mm-hmm. not necessarily in the military, you know, right. maybe sport or, or police or whatever, but right. uh, but that, that, ha- that, yes, absolutely has experience with dogs who, who have that natural tendency to be aggressive and know how to how to recognize it and how to deal with it. And it's, you know, what it boils down to is, is being able to, to be very calculated in your uh, in your rehabilitation training plans and, and kind of setting yourself up for success and knowing, okay, if this happens, we're going to do this. You know, no different than a military operation. You know, when we get the dog out and start to work with it, you know, we have uh, countermeasures put in place to mitigate, uh, you know, any potential mishaps or accidental bites or or whatever to, to really minimize our, our potential liability for anything bad sure. happening. But uh, having said that, you know, stuff still does happen and people still get mm-hmm. bit and Mm. And it's a uh, you know it's part of the process. But. These are dogs that come back from Iraq and Afghanistan and other um, uh, theaters of war. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, overwhelmingly, uh, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan. Some some other hot spots. Uh, and again, we've taken some uh, you know some dogs in from uh, federal law enforcement or, or local level law enforcement mm-hmm. agencies all over the country that had extenuating circumstances. Um, but. But primarily, it's uh, you know it's military dogs that have been uh, in active combat theaters. Mm. Well, the, I tell you, this is a wonderful project. I, I want to uh, donate to this because this is very, very wonderful work that you're doing with this foundation. So, uh, listen, thanks a lot for uh, stopping by, so to speak, and talking with us today. I love your book. It is chock full of brilliant advice for the everyday pet owner the do's and don'ts and uh, laid out very clearly so that it's easy to follow and improve your relationship with uh, with your pets particularly your dogs and uh, I say that because I don't think it'll work for cats but (laughs) but actually the 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 training piece does I've had people (laughs) does it really Uh, absolutely I mean you know psychology is psychology reinforcement uh is reinforcement Mm -hmm. whether I mean for that matter, if you've seen Jurassic World, they use a clicker on the velocity. Yes, and, yes, uh, yes. A, a lot, of, a lot of zoos, uh, uh-huh. horse trainers are using clickers. A lot of zoos, Sea World, same mm-hmm. thing. It's, uh, you know, training is training. When, when you're reinforcing a behavior, it, it's consistent all, over all animal platforms. But well, I'd always heard that cats were untrainable. <laughs> that they just don't. No, they're not. They're uh-huh. they're for sure more stubborn. And, and, and in fact, I mean the. the it really shows the the power of uh, of positive reinforcement when you use a clicker with cats. Mm-hmm. Because, and the same thing with chickens. A lot of people run chicken clinics because you know chickens are so flighty and mm-hmm. uh, you know and, and, and defensive that uh, you know they're the only way you're gonna you're not gonna make them do anything. Same thing with you know Shamu for example. You're not gonna mm-hmm. make Shamu jump in the air. Uh, you know so how do you how do you get them to do that? Well you you just reinforce certain behaviors and, and shape them to the desired outcome. So it, uh, it works with everything, even spouses. So. <laughs> well, I won't let my wife see this book because I might end up getting fully trained. <laughs> That's true. Can't have that. Well, thank you again for uh, joining us today. It's been delightful, and uh, good luck with your, with your book tour. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. We've been talking with uh, Mike Ritland, whose book is called Team Dog, How to Train Your Dog the Navy Seal Way. I wanted to share with you uh, exactly uh, the description of, uh, of Ritland. Uh, I like that uh, he has worked with, uh, says here that um, in Team Dog, How to Train Your Dog the Navy Seal Way, Ritland uses his experiences as trainer and breeder to teach you how to train your pet at home. 
it begins with the most basic skill needed, how to conduct yourself to gain your dog's trust. And once you've established yourself as the team leader, you can achieve any level of traditional obedience that you desire. Now, he has an impressive record. He has worked for the Department of Homeland Security, U.S. Customs, TSA, Department of Defense, as well as elite special forces units in the U.S. military. So I promise you the book is worth your time. Pick it up. You will enjoy it. For Good Books Radio, I'm Dr. W.F. Strong. If you would care to write to me, you can write to me at drwfstrong at gmail.com. We are underwritten by audiobooks.com. For Good Books Radio, I'm signing off, and here's hoping that all your books are good reads.